So this is my robot Hoover Dave, which I showed in an earlier video. Um, and the idea was to try and automate the operation of it in starting and scheduling and such things like that. I took some code that I think Brian Locke had done some with the HTML interface. And I kind of used that to accelerate things a bit. And I used some IR LEDs. And then I got so far with that and then kind of just stopped. Um, as with a lot of things, they fall by the wayside. But also it was how to integrate that into the home automation and everything else. Recently I've moved to Home Assistant, which has been absolutely fantastic. And also if I had much hair, it would be pulling my hair out because some of the automations I do find frustrating. But it is a fantastic product and it's made this project extremely easy. And I'll be showing something called ASP Home today, which has allowed me to use off the shelf hardware with their code in um, YAML code it's called for setting it up and then allows us to pull the things together so as a demonstration I will fire up I'm going to start the recording so you can see the same so as a demonstration you'll see on the side of the screen here we've got the interface that I use for home assistant on my phone and this lists all the devices in the house and you can see here I've got quite a few devices already integrated and the Dave the Hoover he's called Dave this is the piece of hardware that we're using which is basically a Wemos D1 Mini and the IR controller shield which is a pre-done board and worked a lot better than the, the hardware I produced although it does have some misgivings which we'll go into later so as you can see there the top one is Hoover clean so if I do that and it's going to get a bit noisy here so apologies I'll just speak a bit louder but off he goes there and then he's going to bump into me and basically it's one of these dumb hoovers he just goes around um, and then we can do max power which is going to be even louder again and that does like a deeper clean or we can do hoover home that turns off the cleaning part of it and then so you've only got the drive motors going and then that's going to use the IR sensors in here and find his way home at the moment this would only be limited to this room so that I can start it and then I could start a, a max clean and then I would be quite limited in what I could do unless I had multiple IR sensors dotted around each room which is something I may do but it's quite overkill for what the robot is to be honest but it works pretty well so what I'll do is I'll um, he's trying to find his way home and he's gonna hit the microphone so that's gonna be loud um, I can try send him home again okay that seems to have worked as well you can there is other controls that are available and what I've basically done is I just get it it's out of shot here I've used this remote control that it comes with which is an infrared remote control and it's quite a powerful remote and that you can use it it doesn't have to be pointing at line of sight what I did find with this device is that it has to be pretty close just because of the position of the IR sensors on the robot um, and the power of it so that's where one of the misgivings but what I'll do is I'll switch back to the bench and we can look at the code and we will look at the hardware that I'll show um, and we can have a look at that okay so as I mentioned I'm using something called home assistant and home assistant is basically a home automation application there's a few out there like open hub there's domic it's which I've used in the past and but this is the one I've currently settled on it's fantastic for getting your devices into it. Sometimes it's the automation like I touched on earlier that I find frustrating. So here we are at the main screen. And as we can see, we've got Dave the Hoover listed down the bottom here. So as I touched on as well, one of the main integral parts of this is an ecosystem for want of a better description called ASP Home. And what this allows you to do is have these devices which are ESPs as the name suggests so anything that's based such as a Sonoff um, ESP32, ESP8266 or similar and all those variants of the different models as well are supported and the brilliant thing about it is that it allows you to use that common firmware and then customize it via a YAML script if you're only doing one thing it might seem quite onerous but once you start having a few different types of devices 
it's an incredibly flexible setup. So I thought I'd just show this quickly first. Okay. I'm using one of the Wemos Lowland IR controller boards. So that has a receiver built in and then it's got the three IR transmitters at the front and one at the rear there. Um, and then what I've done is I've put it on one of these dual shields, just put the headers on and then you can see there that's the, the board I'm using. And temporarily I'm just running that off a, a power bank. Now ideally it, it could be something that you could power down and put it in deep sleep mode but then the only thing is if you want to start it ad hoc you lose that functionality. So for now I'm probably just going to use a wall watt, have it plugged in permanently and that gives me the flexibility to start it any time I want or attempt to stop it any time I want as well. So what I'm going to show is the desktop again and then it's called Playroom IR. So basically once you've got the ASP Home into your Home Assistant setup is that you would add a device and it's brilliant that there's very little configuration needed. You need to put a name in so we can do Dave Hoover it has to be lowercase and you're allowed underscores though the type of device we're just going to say it's a generic ESP8266 there's a few listed there as you can see um, quite a few in fact more than I thought actually um, a lot of mine have just been the um, generic A266 or in this case we're going to use Wemos D1 Mini click continue you would put in your username and password at this juncture it doesn't do any verification with that you can set an additional password that's used for the over the air updates and that's a brilliant feature that I'll get to so you click continue we'll submit that and then the screen pops up here to say select a port to upload now at the moment we only have an over the air port if you are running ESP home on a dedicated server or PC or even as I'm doing the Raspberry Pi you should be able to plug in a USB cable and then you should have an additional option which would allow you to plug your device directly in there and flash directly to it the way I'm doing it is I'm kind of introducing an extra step but it's just the, the, the easiest way for myself to do it because of where the Pi is located so what that did, one thing I forgot to mention there is how you get that file onto your ESP so as alluded mine's in a different system so then they provide this great ESP home flasher if you've got a USB to serial adapter or similar plugged in or your ESP8266 or your ESP32 plugged directly in, the COM port will appear here. You browse the firmware, which is the bin file that we've created. So we would do compile. Once it's finished compiling, it'll say download binary. So you would get that binary, put it there, and then you would just click flash ESP. It's put that firmware up to it, and that's kind of a for me a one time process so once you've done that because we enabled OTA for over the air um, updating then it'll allow us to make any changes to the code um, such as you know we want to add extra buttons in here extra switches sorry we can go in and do that and then it would just be a case of validation and then we would upload and that will wirelessly upload it to the device the only thing you got to be careful of is you don't change any of the Wi-Fi configuration settings that could then lose connectivity to the to the device. Worst case, you get the device and you plug it back into your machine and you upload the code manually. Not the end of the world, but it's great that everything appears here. And as you can see, you get a quick, at a glance view of what's online, what's offline. This temp center is one that's offline, but it comes on every two minutes, and then you get to see. You can try and capture that by doing show logs, and you would see that. Okay. So what that does is that creates your device and so we have the device here at Dave Hoover. You would then edit that file. Um, this is where we put the configuration in and I'll show the configuration that we've used. Um, so I'll switch to the Playroom I.O. So the basics of it is that you've got the, the name of it, the platform, the board, which we selected from the drop downs you've got the Wi-Fi um, logger is enabled the API is enabled so it works with the home assistant OTA 
is enabled, which means we can update it over the air, which is fantastic. And then it's these parts that are the actual crux of the configuration. So as a starting point, what I did was, and this would technically work for anything, it could be used as a generic infrared sending type device. It just so happens that I'm using it on a Hoover here. So the D1 mini board that I'm using, the transmitter is on pin D3 and the receiver is on pin D4. Then we have inverted set to true. Now this is a particularly important point. With this receiver and the WeMOS board, if you don't set inverted to true, you'll not get any readings at all. And that tripped me up for just a little while. But once I got that figured out, it made a lot more sense. Now the last item in the section is particularly interesting. It makes life a lot easier if you know what type of device codes that are going to be used so NEC in this case it allows you to narrow down things massively you can just put all in here but what you'll find is it picks up everything it's kind of like background noise and light and it'll interpret that as raw signals it'll flood through your input so what I would advise is maybe start with raw and then you can put your remote control close to the device and press and then you can check the logs and if you see a type of device or like NEC or Panasonic, then I would change the filter from all to the type of device that you've got. You could alternatively just cycle through on the website, uh, which I'll link down below for the um, infrared on the ESP home. It does list the types that it supports. So what I did was as a first step was to set this up like this. And technically I don't need this code anymore, but what I did was I set that up and then if I go to show logs, show logs, okay. So we can see that we're connected to my Wi-Fi, and then we have this. So if I enable the overhead, where we've still got this, and then if I bring in and if I press the clean, what you can see there is that first line come up, and it's brilliant that it only shows one entry. So we have the address commands, uh, the, the address, sorry, and the command, and we know it's an NEC device, and that corresponds to exactly what we need to do. So what you can do is, I just opened a notepad window, press the button so that was clean, copy this whole line into notepad, and then went through the buttons one by one that I have. And then what we can do is we can introduce switches. So then we have the format you have switch once, the platform is gonna be remote transmitter, and we've already configured above that that is on D3 you can change the carrier duty percentage and so for mine I've got it set at 50% which I have read in the notes that said 50% for IR if you, you can use this with RF type devices as well that would be 100% I've left it at 50 it works maybe I could do experiments on that and, and see if it works any better but for now that's great so then going into the configuration as I mentioned you got the remote transmitter you need to set a name and it's important to have this as something descriptive because that's going to be passed through to home assistant and that's what you'll actually see you could technically rename it and things but there's no point in creating more hassle for yourself and making something extra you've got to rename then what we're going to say is that we're going to do an NEC output for the remote transmitter and then we have the address command and then we have the command which is the two settings that we just recorded in the previous step so as I mentioned, I did that for Hoover Clean, the Hoover Home, and then there's a max power setting. One other setting to be careful of that tripped me up initially was that in all the examples they give, they have a repeat. And generally you would do that because the commands would be discrete. And so it didn't matter how many times you send, say, television on, you could send it 10, 15, 20 times, and it wouldn't matter because the TV would just turn on and if you're sending the code TV on multiple times it doesn't matter. The reason I recommend generally in the examples it's set to repeat 5 is because sometimes the codes can be missed and picked up by reflections or whatever so it's advisable to, to kind of do that but what I found with the Hoover is that it's a toggle so when you hit clean once it starts to clean then if you hit clean again 
it disables the clean. It doesn't send it home or anything like that, it just stops it. So in the default examples I was using, it was five. So it would really confuse the Hoover. It would go on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. So basically what I'm relying on is that code getting through. And so I, I did, I've got a hundred in there because I tried different settings. But what I've done is basically said it's no repeat. And that's working great. As I showed earlier, it'll press once and off it goes. For the other ones, these are discrete commands rather than toggle. So I've just left it as five just to make sure it gets through. For the ESP Home, that's largely it. You would go to Configurations and Integrations, and then what you should see is it appear straight on here, on the screen, and then you can just click OK, and then you can accept that integration, and then that'll pull it into Home Assistant. What you might find is, if you have it on a different subnet, that you can get tripped up, and so you need to click manually click Add. The reason you have that problem is with MDNS not being propagated through subnets. I actually am doing that, so it means that in ESP Home, I can say if devices are online, which if you haven't got MDNS in place, it won't, but it doesn't do the auto integrations. You can change it instead of MDNS to use ping, so that's maybe something I might look at, but for now, just having to click add on the integrations is not the end of the world and then all you do is from the drop down you say ASP home and then the host would be the name of what we've called so in our case Dave Hoover and then it would find that by the MDNS and pick it up and pull it in so once you've done that you can then place it in a card so if I go to the overview and then we can go to configure UI and then you would go to the plus here. You don't want to do the plus at the top, this will add another card. So you would do plus here, and then we're going to have an entity. And then what you basically do is if you click the down arrow, that'll then list all the entities that you have recorded um, in the system. Oh, it took a little while to catch up there. So yeah, so there's a lot of these, and this is where it can start getting confusing, but you're not showing all these at once. Um, it's kind of hidden in the background unless what you want the system to see. So I went through and if I come back here and I'll cancel that, edit this one, and you can see I've added the switch that we named earlier and this is what I was mentioning about the the name that it shows being something meaningful it makes life easier. So in the background it's called switch.hooverclean but we had associated Hoover clean with a space and a capitalization and that's it. And the great thing is these are toggles, so rather than it permanently be on, it's going to send the signal once. So if we send, press that, as you saw on the app on my phone, it'll send it once, uh, what we configured once, and then the switch goes back to the off state. If we did Hoover Home, it does it once and it off. In actuality, the Hoover Home is going to send that signal 25 to, or five times, sorry. So, and that's it. Um, and then the rest of it is all home automation a home assistant sorry specific setting the automations up how you want it to run and all these kind of things um, and it's a great system and I highly recommend it and especially for these you'll notice on the ASP home I've got a few others configured but I thought this was a good follow-up to the video that I've done with the robot how I've got it working and a good introduction to ESP home I've not made this a whole home assistant video. If anyone wants to know any specifics or thinks it's worth me doing a video, let us know and I can do. But there is a lot of resources out there on how it works and everything like that. What I will probably do is do just specific videos for how my progress is going on it. So I may do just a no red one on just the automations I've done in it. Um, if I choose to use that, that's another method of doing the automations and some of the other things that are going to be coming. So that's my plan going forward. Thanks for watching everyone. Um, please feel free to like, subscribe, and thanks very much.